Thank you for joining us for another episode of... Welcome to tonight's tale. It is hosted by myself, Emily. I'm from Atlanta, and I am joined by my beautiful co-host... Eric from New York, and we are just two friends brought together by our love for fairy tale theater and the beautiful Shelley Duvall. Always. So tonight we are going to be revisiting the episode of Cinderella, which is always a personal favorite of yours and mine, and I think many fairy tale theater fans. Yeah, it's definitely one of the first ones I always think of when I think of the series. Absolutely. It's, it's a classic episode. So what is kind of the first thing that jumps to your mind when you think of Cinderella, fairy tale theater Cinderella? Well, it's just a sweet version of Cinderella. It gives off very fall vibes. Oh, yeah. For me, at least. And I think it's one of the more atmospheric ones. I think very similar to Beauty and the Beast because we get a lot of exterior shots of the house and, you know, Cinderella being outside. And we don't really get a lot of the exterior shots in a lot of the episodes. That's true. I hadn't thought of that, but you're right. Like, we see her in the garden a lot. Mm -hmm. We see her at the clothesline. Mm -hmm. That's true. I hadn't thought of that. And also the autumn vibe. Remember the prince's ball, the theme of which was autumn. (laughs) (laughs) When I first think of this episode, I immediately think of Jennifer Beals, who was, I think, straight off of Flashdance at that time. Mm -hmm. I remember Matthew Broderick, who was still in his Ferris Bueller type glory. They were both so young. They were. They were really, really young. And Eve Arden as the stepmother, she springs to mind a lot because I remember her having a lot of great sharp lines. How familiar were you with the source material, the original tale? I tend to think there's really two classic versions of Cinderella, the French version, the Charles Perrault version, and the Brothers Grimm version. I think as a child, I was more familiar with the Charles Perrault version because they had, you know, obviously book versions of that. I definitely remember there being a Charles Perrault version that I had read as a child that was like a picture book. I was actually the complete opposite. I grew up with the Brothers Grimm version, which is pretty different. The Charles Perrault version, that's Mm -hmm. where you get the fairy godmother and the glass slipper and midnight and the pumpkin. That's all Charles Perrault. The Brothers Grimm was a lot darker. It's interesting to see how those two versions, which seem very different, actually do align very well. Going back to our rewatch, we rewatched the episode tonight. Well, in our rewatch tonight, we definitely got to relive a lot of the very iconic lines where we definitely got to watch Eve Arden just chewing up the scenery. Oh, she was. She definitely was. She was hamming it up. She was loving it. She, you could definitely see she was having a great time. Oh, and Jennifer Beals never looking more innocent. She's like the definition of doe-eyed with those big brown eyes and Matthew Broderick looking so innocent. (laughs) Mm -hmm. The whole cast was just, it was just charming to rewatch. So I'm going to go back to the very beginning of the episode. Mm -hmm. And as always, our episode starts with an introduction by our beloved Shelley Duvall. And she appears at the hearth, which is, of course, a classic Cinderella setting. She's got the hearth, there's the broomstick, and she's sitting in the cinders and appears in a little firework and looks lovely and a little underdressed as far as Shelley's appearances usually are. Normally she goes for the whole Hollywood makeup and in this one, I think very wisely, she chose to play it down a little. She was just a little cinder <laughs> in the fireplace. It turns into a little firecracker. Yeah. Yeah, I love, I love that. It's nice to have some help from a fairy godmother once in a while, but this lucky girl rises from the ashes to discover she only needs to be herself to find true happiness and a prince. Cinderella. After Shelley poofs out, Mm -hmm. we have the cast list and we have the opening narration by the great late Joseph Mayer. He does a beautiful narration throughout the episode. If his voice sounds familiar, he also played the Sultan in Aladdin and His Wonderful Lamp, which we talked about a couple weeks ago. So I think he was a great choice as a narrator. He was actually an Irish actor, 
but he sounds kind of more English in this, but I think he did a beautiful job. We see Cinderella at the window, as you said, an outdoor set, and it starts with the king's messenger delivering the news that her father has died. We see Eve Arden taking the note away from Cinderella. Eve Arden is in the world's worst wig. I remember when I was a kid, I'm like, is she wearing yarn in her hair? I didn't understand the curls. It was such a terrible wig, but I get that it wasn't chosen for realistic purposes. Mm -hmm. It was for comedic purposes. And then we also, in that quick shot, we get an introduction to the two stepsisters, played by Jane Alden and the great Edie McClurg. Mm -hmm. So good. And neither of them really have much lines in this, but... They're hamming it up and we get a very good feel for all four of those female characters. I mean, within like 30 seconds, we understand how each of these women operate. Oh, no! Oh, 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 it's your stepfather. He's dead. So the stepmother, with the help of her two daughters, began immediate preparations for a most impressive funeral, making sure that all the right people would be in attendance. And over the top, <laughs> beautifully over the top. Cinderella doesn't even have a line here. We don't hear Cinderella talk until the next scene. Well, actually, no, the next scene is her sitting at the cinders. Crying. Crying, and we have the narrator explaining that she's the only one who truly mourned the death of her father. Right. Everyone else was about how big of a show they can make out of this. The scene after that is where we have Cinderella walking in. She's the only one dressed in black, which kind of symbolic, maybe a little over the top, but it worked. Yeah, she's the only one mourning. I can't believe my father's really gone. It's difficult for us all. Well, enough gloom for one day. So they start to divvy up the household chores, which of course means Cinderella doing all of them. The sweeping, polishing, cleaning, scouring, dishes, trash, gardening, bed making, and various miscellaneous chores, including laundry and everything else, will be done by Cinderella. <laughs> Any questions? I wrote down during the rewatch Eve Arden, beloved character actress. She was hysterical in so many movies. She could be dramatic. And I've seen so many of her performances, but when she was... The principal in Greece. That was what I wrote down! <laughs> that was exactly what I wrote down! Because I was when she was dealing out all of Cinderella's chores, I'm going, out of all the roles I've seen her in, she is reminding me most of the principal in Greece. <laughs> Mr. Nagarelli. <laughs> I know. That was exactly the first role of hers that jumped to mind right there. And I will be in charge of being in charge. I love it. So funny. Arlene, you shall be <laughs> wearing the latest fashions. Oh, no. Bertha was in charge of taking baths. Brushing her own hair and maintaining an attractive appearance, to which Edie McClurg has the great line. See, I'm not complaining. <laughs> then Arlene was in charge of relaxing, wearing fashionable clothing, and occasionally answering the door. Oh, Mother, I hate that door thing. All right, Cinderella, you'll answer the door. So funny. God so bless her. Yeah, it, that's funny. You and I both had the same thought. But principal in Greece, that's the, that's the role that this most brings up to and mind. She, she's like acting this exactly the same way. Like it's so campy and so funny. And it so works. Yeah. It so works. Okay, so Cinderella tries as politely as she can to object to doing everything. <laughs> and that's when we have a great little monologue by Eve Arden. You see, nature has been very kind to you. You've been blessed with incredible beauty, a sweet disposition, and a loving heart. These are qualities that are totally absent from myself and my daughters. 
Therefore, in order to balance the scales of nature, which have been unfairly tipped in your favor, it is only right that we should treat you like dirt. Well, I'm not sure that I agree with that logic. Well, think of it as a good deed. You kiss up to us, we despise you, and everybody is happy. But I'm not happy. Splendid. We then cut to a montage of Cinderella doing all the work. She's scrubbing the chimney. She's polishing the stepsister's shoes. She's hanging up the laundry. She's got that makeshift, like, vacuum that she's pumping. <laughs> I know. That's <laughs> a very strange contraption that she was doing. She's blowing dust everywhere. Then we have, after that montage, we cut to the stepsisters painting the most absurd painting. <laughs> I'm, I've had some weird bonding projects with my sister, but I've, I've never painted her holding grapes, holding her grapes face. making a fish face. <laughs> hey, you know what? They're bonding. I give them credit for sister bonding time. Yes. That was just a hilarious visual gag. Cinderella, but, answer the door. <laughs> poor Arlene had to stop painting her sister making a fish face at grapes and walk all the way across the room to answer the door. And behind the door, we get the adorable Mark Blankfield in a cameo. Good day. My name is Edgar. Is Cinderella Bell? What's it to you? Uh, well, you see, we went to school together many years ago, and I just got back into town and thought I'd stop by and surprise her. And he's charming and handsome, and he... He's there with flowers. He's there with flowers. He wanted to look her up, and I... I love this little addition. Cinderella did have a past. She did have men who were interested in her. You brought that up during our rewatch. Yeah, and it's almost like showing us that she is just being kept down by her stepsisters and stepmother by keeping her closed off from the world in that house, just keeping her there doing all the work and the housework and just making her feel like she's in dirty nothing. Exactly. Every day. And Actually, this character, I mean, first of all, it was a hilarious gag to have Mark Blankfield do that little cameo. And, of course, we later see him again in a much bigger part in Jack and the Beanstalk. But anyway, it kind of does add some dimension to Cinderella's character. It's not that no one else appreciated her. It's that no one else could get to her. Yeah, she's not here. Uh, yeah, she's dead. She died. <laughs> <laughs> it's horrible. It's uh, and kudos to Mark because he plays it so straight. His jaw hits the floor. Oh no! What a tragedy. I, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Well, we got over it. Bye. <laughs> and slams the door. <laughs> Always felt sorry for Edgar there. Always so felt sorry for him. I don't know. What if Cinderella got with Edgar instead of the prince? What I, if that happened? He seemed to be a decent guy. She probably would have lived happily ever after with him, too. Yeah. Anyway, that was an interesting... And I swear, I remember this. I don't remember it in the actual German fairy tale Aschenputtel, but I know that there is a version where stepsisters or someone is trying to keep the heroine away from suitors, and they, mm -hmm. just, they just tell them she's dead. Might have been the original Beauty and the Beast. Maybe. The suitors would come back and they'd take the presents and just say she died. That's possible. That that might be where that came from. I also wrote down about the costumes. So basically Cinderella's pink or purple. What would you call that pink or purple? Pink. That was pink. Like it, a very dark pink. Oh, it was pink covered in... Dirt. Dirt, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a definitely a recycled costume from A Little Red Riding Hood. Oh, yeah. That was the outfit that the wolf wears when he's trying to fool... Little Red Riding Hood, that he's actually the grandmother. I think the grandmother wore it, too, but I think... I think she did, yeah. I think, who wore it better? Jennifer Beals or Malcolm McDowell? <laughs> <laughs> I think for different reasons. <laughs> this one I'm going to give to Jennifer Beals, but Malcolm <laughs> McDowell did make it his own. I'll, I'll give him that. And then we also see another recycled costume from the same episode. From the same little, episode. Little Red Riding Hood is Mary's hood. 
Yeah, we, we see the little red riding hood. I think Arlene wears it to Arlene the ball. Arlene to the ball as her like cape over her dress before yeah. she heads out. And so I love that, that we see some of these costumes come back, which is... Now, before we have the stepsisters departing for the ball, we, we just had Edgar leave and we have the advisor to the king mm-hmm. or Grand Duke. We're, we're not quite sure what his title is, but... He shows up to invite the stepsisters to the ball, mm-hmm. and Edie McClurg has the classic line, Would you like something to drink? Perhaps some ham? <laughs> I never understood that line when I was a kid. To this day, I still don't quite. Did she think ham was a drink? <laughs> Tim, Tim Thomerson, he's the royal advisor. That's what they have him listed as. Royal advisor, okay. Mm-hmm. He's the second dude. He's the king's second dude, whatever you want to call him. He's looking real good. He, he was. He was looking quite handsome and <laughs> very clearly scared of the stepsisters. Because they're all over him. They're, they're all, all over him and, him and yeah. they're confusing drinks with ham and I don't know. <laughs> He's like, what? Where did I walk into? <laughs> and he does his job. He invites them to Prince Henry's autumn ball, the theme of which is autumn. Autumn. <laughs> <laughs> And guests will be entertained by the music of Arturo and his band of merry cellists. And if you haven't seen Arturo and his band of merry cellists, well, you haven't lived. Ah! And Arturo, fun fact, is played by Charlie Dell, who is in many episodes of Fairy Tale Theater. We see him pop up many times. Is he in Princess he's and in, the Peas? He's in Tale of the Frog Prince. He's in The Nightingale. He's in Princess and the Pea. Yeah, he, I remember him in Princess and the Pea. In Tale of the Frog Prince, Charlie Dell plays the page. Yeah, and he played... He goes, they brought you a gift. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in The Nightingale, he's... Um, I don't remember him in Nightingale. Yeah, Nightingale, he's the chef. When he comes in, he goes, stuffed with a goose. Stuffed with a... The- Remember when he brings out the food for the emperor? Oh, vaguely. That's, that's him. And oh. then he's also in Princess and the Pea. Now, he, I remember him in Princess and the Pea. And in Princess and the Pea, he's the servant. Yeah, he held the royal handbook on his back. That, God, we know all these. It's I, so sad that we know all this. It's not sad. It means we're true fans. <laughs> But all of these references you'll get later on in our podcast when we go to those episodes. Because we we've there, seen them all. <laughs> we've seen them all many, 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 many times. <laughs> we have them going to the ball. Uh-huh. And it cuts to the stepsisters getting ready for the ball. And there's a very <laughs> famous shot of Edie McClurg being laced into a corset. <laughs> and I give so So much props to Edie McClurg for allowing herself. She's a very lovely woman. And she is shot completely like a clown. And I give her real credit for that because... Who puts someone in a corset sitting down? That's a good point. (laughs) That's a good point. Scarlett was holding a bedpost. Rose is holding a bedpost. Most women would be, yeah. Most famous corset scenes from Gone with the Wind, Titanic, they're they're holding a bedpost standing up. Yeah, because you're lacing your waist back. You need to have, yeah, you're right. That's a very good point. They're Obviously, they're doing it for comedic effect, but oh my God, that's funny that you caught that. (laughs) And she honestly is not that big. No, she's not. But the way they filmed her, and I mean, kudos to her for allowing herself to just be the clown. I I love that. Lucille Ball was actually a beautiful, glamorous woman, and she had no problem with making a clown of herself. So I totally respect that. Now, we have the beautiful wisdom of Eve Arden's. And remember, girls, don't act too smart. Men are intimidated by intelligent women. What do you mean, intelligent Oh, never mind. And Eve Arden takes a look at her two daughters and realizes this is not something she needs to worry about. (laughs) She's like, never mind. (laughs) Too funny. Okay, so there's a scene, Cinderella wanting to go to the ball. And this was actually something I noticed in the original fairy tale. Mm -hmm. In the German fairy tale, she wants to go to the ball the second she hears about it. She wants it. And I don't blame her. She's like, you know, my life is pretty up the crapper. And here's a chance where I can, you know, 
call the shots, I'm in. So Cinderella, or as they call her, little Ash girl in the German version, Mm -hmm. she's all in second she hears about it. Now, in the French version, she has two names from her two different stepsisters. The nicer stepsister calls her Cinderella. The older, meaner stepsister calls her Cinder Slut. Now, that might vary on translation, but that is... <laughs> the older stepsister was meaner and called her Cinder Slut. The younger, nicer one called her Cinderella, which, you know, wasn't a ton better, but it was a bit better. Anyway, in the French version, Cinderella isn't really expecting to go to the ball. It's like, oh, one more function I'm not invited to. It it was such a non-event, but the stepsisters kind of make a game and the stepmother kind of makes a game going, hey, maybe you should go. (gasps) Could I? And then they start to mess with her like that. And that's what kind of planted the seed in her mind that she she should go. And I kind of saw that with the fairy tale theater version where it was the steps, the stepsisters going, what will you be wearing to the ball, Cinderella? Oh, I just assumed I wasn't going. It was the stepsisters planting the seed because it didn't even, and I think that makes more sense. It wouldn't even occur to her that she'd go. And in the Disney version, uh, you have the stepmother that tells her that she can go if she does all of her chores. Like she likes a whole list of things for her to do if she can, if she can, and then she'll be able to go. That's the German version. And they were like, yeah. well, which was like, well, how am I going to do this and finish my dress? Yeah. In the German version, it's, I want to go, well, pick out all the lentils from the hearth. Which is the version they use for Into the Woods, yeah. Yeah. And Into the Woods followed the German version pretty closely. Yeah. <laughs> There's also a Czech version called Three Wishes for Cinderella that follows the German version very, very closely. Oh, I've seen one. I think I sent it to you. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Anyways, it's more like the stepmother's just playing games with her because she wants to go and gives her all these impossible tasks. And then she does them and she still can't go. In the Mm. French version, she never expected to go until the stepsisters like got the idea in her head. Oh, you can go. Of course you can go. Right. And then even after that, she's still, in the French version, Cinderella's a little more practical. She's like, well, even if I got permission to go, what the heck would I wear? In the German version, she's like, oh, I'll do everything. I'll do everything. And then my stepmother will love me and give me a dress. And it's denial. I think I think the German version is in denial. Well, I think the Disney <laughs> version was even more sad because she ended up accomplishing everything. She did all the chores and the mice made her the dress and she comes down in her dress and they just like rip her dress to shreds. Yeah, it's it's the worst. worst, It's the worst of both. That for me is like the saddest version. Like that's so sad. Like that, I don't know, even to this day, I'll watch that scene and it breaks my heart. It's so sad. Oh yeah. And it's supposed to. It's It's like, oh, that's my bow. Oh, that's my sash. It's so not fair. It's so not fair. It's so sad. Poor Cinderella. Here's where we get to the classic part where the different versions change. Now, in the German version, how does Cinderella get to the ball? It's a tree planted on her mother's grave. Mm -hmm. And if you kind of read into it, it might be her mother's spirit. Yeah, pretty much. That uh, brings her the dress. So she's done everything she can. Her stepmother still says, well, you got nothing to wear. And her stepmother and stepsisters take off. She goes, cries at her mother's grave grave and the birds at the tree well don't even make her just appear with it yeah so you kind of get the impression that it was her mother's spirit that kind of just brought her the dress and she's like okay cool and she's got a dress and she just hightails it off there's no deal with the coach or anything maybe the prince lives next door that's never quite explained what about the slippers gold slippers in the german version that her mother gives her the tree yeah the tree the birds, the mud, however you want to interpret it. But the, the dress and gold slippers, not glass slippers, but they appear that way. Now, in the French version, and here's something that kind of bothers me about every movie version, including fairy tale theater, that follows the French version. Cinderella seems surprised that she has a fairy godmother. Was this kept a secret from her? <laughs> Because in the fairy tale, it's just, no, her godmother showed up and was like, hey, chick, what you doing tonight? Oh, you want to go? Oh, I can help you because I'm a fairy. But she knew her godmother was around the whole time. 
Interesting. <laughs> she didn't just magically appear that one night. Hmm. She was kind of always in the picture. And Cinderella knew she was a fairy, but it kind of seemed like she was, yeah, she's my godmother and she's a fairy, but she kind of wants me to solve my own problems kind of deal, which I respect because I always thought fairy godmother appearing out of thin air that's never been around your whole life. I always thought weak plot device, but... <laughs> When I read the fairy tale, it makes a little more sense going, oh no, she was always kind of around. That's interesting. Because yeah, that is a good point. She always seems shocked. Who are you? Honey, I'm your fairy godmother. Didn't you see me poof next to you? I didn't know I had a fairy godmother. Well, most people don't. You see, we keep a very low profile. <clears throat> And we're very selective about when and where we offer assistance. Yes, we have the great Jean Stapleton appearing in a, a cute little special effect in a rocking chair. I love her. She just always gives such good feels. She's putting on a good southern accent. I live in Georgia, I can say. I, I think she did a pretty good southern accent there. Definitely affected, but it was a good good accent there. I'm, I'm not quite sure why they made that choice, but probably for comedic effect, she could deliver her lines a little little more sing-song. And then we have her making the pumpkin into a carriage for right. Cinderella. I pointed that out that we've never seen them clean out the pumpkin. I've never seen that in a movie, but no I- No movie version. No. I mean, I honestly thought before I reread the Perot version, I thought they just invented this for a fairy tale theater, you know, to make it funny. They're digging out a pumpkin, but it was actually mentioned in the Perot version that she took out the guts. I mean, not like actually digging out with her hands, but they mentioned that she just used the rind of the pumpkin. So someone at Fairy Tale Theater went, oh, that might be a cute little scene, a little bonding moment for Cinderella and her godmother. And it was also comedic because Jean Stapleton's like, do you want all those stringy things? And do you want giant seeds in your, in your carriage? <laughs> she brings up a good point, you know? And it's like, oh, that's like good imagery. I don't want that. That's kind of gross. That's good Southern logic for you. <laughs> that's, that's why she's a Southerner right there. Too funny. <laughs> also, that conversation between Cinderella and the godmother, that gives a little exposition and a little insight into Cinderella's character because right. she's talking about her stepmother and stepsisters, but she's very forgiving about them. Mm -hmm. This is another departure between the French and German fairy tales. In the German fairy tale, she resents them for what she's done. She's not necessarily bitter, but she's not forgiving. In the French version, she's very forgiving. And Jennifer Beals has this line says, I don't know, maybe they can't help the way that they are. That's very forgiving, very empathetic, and well. And I think that's supposed to be the the message in, in Cinderella is like, I, I heard some critiques where they're like, well, Cinderella is just a pushover. Basically it's saying, oh, you should just sit around and wait for your prince. No, Cinderella persevered and she made the best out of her situation. And she thought to be kind was the way to get through life and to be understanding and kind. Yeah, I think this is the ultimate difference between the two versions and why I always differentiate them. I think the message between the French version is more good things come to those who wait, be kind, it comes to those most rewarding. And the German version is more about karma. <laughs> I think the German version is more about if you're good, you get good. If you're bad, you get bad. Maybe I identify more with the German version. Yeah. But the French version is much more forgiving. And clearly Jennifer Beale's performance here is more based on the forgiving and the good things come to those who wait. It's more focused on Cinderella and how she's such an ultimately good person that even when people are treating her like dirt and say they're treating her like dirt, she still doesn't hate them. She just kind of forgives Whereas them. other people would. Yeah, definitely yeah. feel resentment and hate. We do get them cleaning out the pumpkin and she turns the pumpkin into the coach with very cheesy 80s special effects. The coach with no doors? That coach, I made a note. And I'm a like, chair? First of all, how 80s with the twinkle lights, and it's, I really don't understand She has this. a chair. I don't understand this coach. I had more exotic floats when I put together homecoming in high school. And it's a, a lawn chair. chair on a wagon with twinkle lights. Yeah. I mean, a very low budget carriage. It's dangerous, okay? I was worried about her. It She's moves. been. Oh, and moved too. I know. I'm like, did they anchor that down? I felt bad for Jennifer Beals because 
I mean, they wouldn't let us get away with that in Homecoming in 1999. <laughs> well, granted, you also probably had a pickup truck pulling it. <laughs> Not going that much faster. <laughs> it didn't look safe. I was worried about her, okay? I wasn't worried about her. Well, before she even gets in that carriage, let's talk about that dress. Dress number one oh, for the first wall. Oh, my goodness. Good that point. That yellow dress. Well, it's not yellow. It's ivory. It's ugly. It is ugly. I, With the poop sleeves. How 80s. And the gold decor. It, it was, I get the... I get what they were trying to do. They were trying to do little leaf decors because it was mm -hmm. all autumn themed. No. No, all I agree now. with you. I'm going, that is the ugliest. And then she had this little, like, yarmulke made out of, like, <laughs> yarmulke. like made out of flowers. Like, that's, what was going on? That's true. It, it was so bad. It didn't make sense. It was ugly. It was very 80s poof sleeves. And, and then I love so that. With 80s. that dress, with the ugly dress, one of the stepsisters comes up to her and is like, oh, my God, where'd you get this dress? Yeah, where? At the dumpster? That's what I was wondering. <laughs> Awful. <laughs> Horrendous. From the, from I love your dress. Where do you? How do you love her dress? Are you blind? Eh, she got it from Molly Ringwald's garage sale. With all and they painted some gold leaves on it. Oh my with God. a stencil. So eighties, and I love you, Molly Ringwald. Even Molly Ringwald would agree eighties wasn't the best fashion moment. But yeah, that was not the dress. And then let's talk about when Henry meets Cinderella. Well, actually. Let's pause about the name Henry here because... Oh, you pointed this out. Yes, this aired in 1985. Now, Prince... We all call him Prince Harry, but his real name is, of his course, name. Prince Henry. Mm -hmm. So I'm pretty sure that Prince Henry was named after Prince Harry, same as Rapunzel's prince in fairy tale theater. They were both named Prince Henry shortly after Prince Harry was born in 1984. And this has been a common theme. Prince Philip in Sleeping Beauty, Disney's mm -hmm. Sleeping Beauty, was about seven years after Prince Philip married Queen Elizabeth. Oh, okay. So it does seem to be a very that common thing. That was the 60s, theme. right? The 60s that 19... Sleeping Beauty came out? Sleeping Beauty, Disney's Sleeping Beauty came out in 1959. Okay. Queen Elizabeth was 1952. We talked okay. about how it was a little bit awkward, them meeting, because... Matthew Broderick looks so much shorter in comparison to Jennifer Beals. Yeah, actually, Jennifer Beals looks a couple inches taller than Matthew Broderick, and I don't think she is. I think they're the same height. Yeah. But for some reason, they decided to put her in high heels over him, which, now, don't get me wrong. I have no objections with a girl being taller than a boy. None at all. But when you're going for that romantic, classic fairy tale shot of the prince dancing with the princess, I don't really think you should intentionally make her taller than the prince. No. You don't need to necessarily make him taller with lifts either. You could just put her in ballet flats. Yeah, and they, don't, the they don't show her shoes until the next, until she's back in her rags. They never show her. The only time they showed her shoes was when she put them on. Right. And exactly. that whole scene, she doesn't lose them in the first fall. So she could have very well been in ballet flats because she had a gown that reached the floor. Yeah. So there, it made no sense. It made zero sense. There was no reason to actually make her taller than her And you could also put prince. him in a little lift. I've worn them at times. It's okay. You need a lift sometimes. Sometimes you can have like a little heel on your dress shoe, gentlemen. It's it's okay. And sometimes... And Matthew Broderick needs it. He's only 5'8". So... Well, and sometimes girls who are taller will go in ballet flats... Actually, a great example would be Nicole Kidman. When she was married to Tom Cruise, yes. she would only go out in flats. Why not just let them be the same height? Because when they're at the fountain later on in the episode, sitting, they're at the same height when they're, when yeah. they're kissing. Yeah, and that fountain. looked extremely natural yeah. and beautiful. But them dancing... Awkward. It did look a bit awkward. It did. I mean, put the ugly 80s dress aside. The fact that he's shorter than her. Because he's leading her. It looks just awkward. It just, yeah, it kind of takes you out of the moment a little bit. It takes you out of the fairy tale yeah. for a moment. Now, we do have, during the ball scene, we have the stepsisters run up. And they're going, oh, what a gorgeous dress. And we should be friends. That was awful. <laughs> well, it was obviously Something done. Something good in that punch. It was done for comedic effect. But in the original fairy tale, it was actually the opposite way. It was Cinderella went out of her way to 
talk to her stepsisters yeah. to bring them, I think it was lemons and oranges that the prince had given her. She wanted to share them with her stepsisters who, when you think about it, were the only other people she knew at that right. dance. Even though they didn't know her, she knew them. So she kind of went out of her way to be nice to them. And right. they're like, oh, the princess is being nice to me. It again goes to the French version, which is Cinderella wants to be friends with everyone, even if they have not been nice to her. She's a total angel. You know something? You could come over to our house and visit sometime. Yeah, we could get to be best friends. That would be nice. And you could come too. Of course. <laughs> Most obnoxious women I've ever met. Oh, let's go tell Mother. <laughs> he those calls them obnoxious. He goes, those are the most terrifying women I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. We get a cute little moment from a bit actor playing Alfred. Oh, God, love that. Clearly doing a Ted Danson cheers type vibe. Like drunk last call kind of character. No, but his hair and the way he was walking, I totally got early Ted David Danson. David McCharen? Okay. He was in Popeye with oh that with, with, with Shelley, Shelley and, Robin. and Robin and hello lonely maiden quite a bash huh name's Alfred I'm very famous can I help you nah oh you she's with you oh I didn't know disappear oh. Alfred okay. He was wonderful in that little bit part. Quite a few of her episodes, he brought she brought him in. I guess. Yeah, that... I thought he was in a couple fairy tale theater episodes. But, but we're yeah, we're going been... to keep an eye for David Mc... McCharen. McCharen, and he's been actually in nine episodes altogether. So he was in The Prince and the Pea, Thumbelina, The Boy Who Left Home, Snow Queen, Puss in Boots, Princess Who Never Laughed, Dancing Princesses. He's been in quite a few. Okay, so we're going to keep an eye out for him in our upcoming episodes. Yeah, we have to watch out for him because he's a little, even that little bit, he's a bit of a I know, he, he only had like, what, two, three lines, but everyone remembers him. <laughs> so he did a great job and I guess he must have been a friend of Shelley's. I normally don't recognize bit players, but this guy for his, what, three lines? We both remember, we're talking about him like almost 40 years later, so... Kudos to you. Yeah, he did steal that little scene right there. He absolutely did. We move on. Cinderella and her prince have their dance. Midnight, which is only in the French version, as I recall. In the German version, she just is ready to leave and wants to leave so she can beat her stepmother home. Oh, she doesn't have a deadline? No, she just wants to beat her stepmother home. Oh, that's smart. But anyway, in the French version, it's midnight. So they danced... She runs away. She does get home. She changes. Her godmother's waiting for her. And she wants to know the tea. She, she wants to be like, what happened? Exactly. And I love Cinderella's response because she sounded just like me when I was in high school. And she has this great... Oh, fairy godmother, I had the most wonderful night of my life. Well, don't just stand there swoon and tell me all about it. Well, I walked in. And everyone stopped and stared at me. And the prince, he was so handsome. And he was by my side all night. And we danced, and we talked, and we had melon balls. And I really liked the prince a lot. A lot of how Cinderella is written is like she's a high school girl. It's very much first love. Because I think she's supposed to be. She's supposed to be like a well, teenager, right? Yes, exactly. This has actually come up a couple of times with fairy tale theater. The actors were much older than the characters they portrayed, and sometimes it comes across, some people say a little ridiculous, but I'd say it's kind of charming. But yes, Jennifer Beals was clearly in her mid-twenties, and she's playing about 16. That kind of works. It makes more sense once you see Dennis Christopher as Jack and the Beanstalk or Tatum O'Neill as Goldilocks and they're playing much younger than they, they really were. Yeah, but this works. It does work. It's just... She's got that whole like innocence about her. That's how... It's kind of how fairy tale theater went. They just cast the adult actors and had them act younger. I don't remember them casting children outside of Hansel and Gretel. No. So... Yeah, no. That was the only children episode, yeah. Yeah, at least the, the only one that jumps to mind. Well, you have the child in Pied Piper. He was a child. Right, but 
Okay, there were some supporting characters. Yeah, but not main characters. Yeah. Hansel and Gretel is the only one I can really think of where they actually cast a child actor. The rest, they just cast adult actors acting as children. And that's clearly what they were doing with Cinderella yeah, here. Pinocchio. And you clearly have Jennifer Beals and Matthew Broderick acting as if they're about 10 years younger than they actually were. But it works because they're very, like, sin and... And they're committed. Yeah. They are totally committed. And you can kind of buy it that they'd both be so sheltered. The prince would be sheltered in his castle and Cinderella was clearly sheltered. It works. So our next scene, we have the king. Yeah. Played by the late, great James Noble, who stole every scene he was in. He was wonderful as With the his king. bottle of liquor that he's carrying around. I, during our rewatch, I went, I never noticed that he was carrying around a bottle of liquor. I love that. <laughs> I mean, he was clearly playing it drunk. Ah, oh, I know, I hate him too. About five, ten minutes of that chit chat, yakety yak. I'm gone. I go off to the kitchen, sniff a little brandy. Have you ever talked about Chef Jacques? <laughs> He's a heck of a nice guy. Love that. You know, the prince is like crying because he like can't, he just lost the love of his life, he feels like. Okay, we've got the heartbroken prince, and I mean, it's just, it's such a cute moment. We've got the heartbroken prince, he met the love of his life, she ran away, we got his tipsy father, and you know what? He might be tipsy, but he is calling it out. Huh, old hard to get play. (laughs) He's calling it out. He's actually extremely wise. Well, you know, she likes to come to parties. Throw another party. Let's have another ball. So, actually, he's the brains behind it. So, Henry agrees and says, prepare the melon balls. And they agree they will do another ball next week because the king's tired. I love that he's like, oh, keep the decorations because (laughs) I will save a little money. He's a cheapskate. (laughs) I love that. The king's a cheapskate. Good for him. Save the taxpayers money. So, that's great. So, then we get, I guess they just jump ahead to the next ball. They don't even, like, waste any time, really. Yeah, not really. Oh, should we talk about the ballroom set? Oh, yeah, you love that. Oh, I love it because it's very clearly recycled or will be recycled. I'm not sure which came first. I think Dancing Princesses came later. It came later. It's one of the last episodes. Right, but Cinderella and Dancing Princesses clearly have the same ballroom. They just, in Cinderella, they had the steps going down. In Dancing Princesses, they had the steps going up. But the same minimalist sets... With the drapes. With the drapes and the little flower arrangements in between the columns. I mean, very clearly. We cut to Cinderella back at her house. The second ball is in full swing and she's going, please, where are you when I really need you? And she shows up. Where is your faith? Cinderella's on top of it this time. She's got the pumpkin already carved out. She's got the rat and the mice all in little cages. I admire this. This shows she's a (laughs) go-getter. So we get to the part with the second ball and the fairy godmother gifts Cinderella her second dress. We love that dress. We we like that one. (laughs) It's a good one. It's beautiful. It's actually not dated. I mean, 1985, the first one looked really dated. This one, I think, is very timeless. Yeah, and she's pretty, and she's in white, and it's, like, flowery, and it's really pretty. It was beautiful. And we have her going off on the same dangerous coach that I still feel nervous about. If I were Jennifer Beals, I wouldn't have felt great just even in that little shot going forward all at 12 feet and her and the prince at this point are like dancing cheek to cheek well before that she arrives she arrives he's He's waiting waiting for for her her. yeah the the king's like you know she might not show well i'll be in the kitchen (laughs) i love the king hanging out with Jacques. yeah so cinderella arrives and they're dancing cheek to cheek and the father and the king is bothering them and he's like are you gonna introduce me he's like father we're we're dancing dancing. (laughs) No, He's like, to... well, I'm the king. You should introduce me. He's like... And Cinderella is the polite one here. <laughs> and he's like, come back later, please. <laughs> like a very, like, teenager response. Like, it Dad, leave us alone. <laughs> the king's like, no need to get huffy about it. 
It's really cute. It's a cute little scene. And then I pointed this out to Emily, that scene very much, the following scene where they're at the fountain and they're kissing at the fountain is very reminiscent of the Disney version where they're at the fountain. Oh, 100%. And the moon. It was like, like an homage. Reflecting. Yeah, it's a very much an homage to that. I thought the dialogue in that scene was kind of uncomfortable. Yeah, it was weird. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I thought it was. It's supposed to be all romantic and everything, but... Do you know anything about kissing? Yes. I'm almost certain it has something to do with the lips. Like mine? Yes. They get very close together. Almost touching. Oh, no. Please. No one, like no one ever tried that line. That like line it. will not work. No, I don't like it. It it made me very uncomfortable. It was, it was cringe. Thank you. We did not talk about this during our rewatch, but apparently neither of us liked it. I've never liked it. It's uncomfortable. Because they're really cute up until that interaction. That interaction is very cringe. It is. And I... I don't know who wrote it. That's not good. This is one time where I think the actors were all on point. The director was all on point. The music, well, I guess there wasn't music, but the art direction, it the was, music was all... was cute. The waltz, that was yeah. cute. We liked but it. But I'm saying that that fountain scene, I don't think there was any music. I was music. singing it before to you. Yes, he was. <laughs> yes, he was. We like Cinderella's waltz. He serenades me sometimes. <laughs> but anyway, that fountain scene... Awkward. It, I just have Fringe. to I just have to lie that at the hands of the scriptwriter because it just seemed very juvenile dialogue but even juvenile I didn't talk that way when I was 16. <laughs> I never said, "Do you know anything about kissing?" It's just weird. It, it sounds like someone who's 45 thinks that's how 15-year-olds talk. And no, they don't. That's not how they talk. <laughs> I think they were trying to he's make like, a... how was that? And she's like, it was nice. It was weird. It was, no, please don't. It was uncomfortable. I'm uncomfortable. And... I don't think it's cute. It's not. It was all directed to be charming and shy, but you know what? They should have just removed all the dialogue because the setting was there. The actors were there. It was... The fountain, the moon, just had them kiss and... Exactly. Call it a night and then she's leaving. Maybe add a little music in the background. That's how I would have done it. Yeah, I just, the dialogue kind of actually takes me out of the moment. Oh, and I hated it. Yeah, we're, okay, we're, we're in complete agreement. That, so that then, fountain scene is kind of uncomfortable. So then at this point, Cinderella makes her exit because of it's course at this time it's midnight. Of course, kind of convenient. And she darts for it and leaves behind her shoe infamously. Well, first she runs through three different copies of the same set. Yeah, they just did takes of her running through the same set. Yeah, that ballroom set, they just changed the lighting and she ran through it three times. But I <laughs> guess I guess that's a palace. Get a cute... It's the palace, Emily. Put your, use your imagination. It's the palace. <laughs> the palace just has a bunch of empty ballrooms out front. I, uh, I, I'm confused. Open ballrooms, open concept ballrooms, where it's all open to the outside. Okay, I really want to see what this palace looks like, because it just looks up like a bunch of empty rooms. <laughs> I don't, I don't understand. I'm confused. So she leaves, and she leaves behind the shoe, and I love the joke, like the king is like, You still don't know her name? What have you been calling her? Hey, you? Good point, actually. The king brings up a good point. He goes, the she goes, goes well, she left her shoe. She, he goes, well, it's most certainly not mine. <laughs> oh, that wasn't the king. That was that was the advisor. The advisor, yeah. Because uh, he's going, have you been here? Well, actually, my prince, sir, he's, uh, and he whispers, okay. So he had a little bit yeah, of a. So funny. And then he finds this glass shoe and he's going, not mine. <laughs> said it a little too quickly. Goes, well, I think she left her shoe. He goes, well, it's most certainly not mine. I don't know. It might have been his dates. We never saw his dates. And he's date. just like staring at the shoe where it's like right by his face. I'm like, is he going to smell it? Okay. Like, what's, what's going on here? And in the French version, it's weird too. Because in the French version, he gets the shoe and he's 
stares at it for hours. The ball is still going on and he's staring at a shoe. Everyone's going, oh, he's in love with her. And I'm going, he's got issues. Now in the German version, the reason she leaves the shoe is because he saw her trying to escape. So he tarred the steps and she got stuck. That's how she She lost the shoe. Yeah, they do that in Into the Woods. Yeah, I, I love that. It makes more sense. In the French version, she just runs away and falls out of her shoe. That's kind of smart. He was trying to trap her there so she wouldn't run away again. This is one one time where the German version makes more sense. But the French version, she just slips out of her shoe, which is what happens here. So the prince finds the shoe and and the fairy tale just stares at it for the rest of the night, which apparently the other ladies of the court find romantic. I find it disturbing. (laughs) But He's that, got a foot fetish. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> so then he goes on to making everyone try on the shoe. Yes, and that was the king's idea. And we pointed out there's this one lovely Asian lady in a geisha outfit. I know. I'm, I'm, and she's wearing the same exact outfit at both balls. And I'm going... And he, it's clearly not her. And he still makes her try on the shoe. I'm like, first of all, the prince is pretty thick that he clearly can't remember the face of the woman he's in love with, but... I, also I'm, not her race. Yeah, that's what I said during our rewatch. I'm like, is it too much to ask that he'd remember her race? But the irony is she was in this She's in the costume. exact same dress. <laughs> All three scenes. The first ball, the second ball, and the second And trying scene. it on. She's in the same dress and he still... It hasn't figured out and that so that's are not her. All the royals from the they're, ball, they're all in their same gowns. That's true. It's like, no, it's not that girl with the green dress. No, I remember her. No, you don't. Do you have amnesia? You don't remember any of these people. It wasn't Nancy Lenahan. We saw Nancy Lenahan. Oh, we love her. She played the sister in Beauty and the Beast, yeah. and she played a fun lady at the ball. She showed up in the same dress. Everyone. Henry talked to her in that dress, but. No, let's have her try on the shoe. I've always thought the prince in Cinderella was pretty thick, but this... Dumb. Yep. Oh, and we haven't even gotten to when they try on the slippers because that's when the German prince is really thick. Yeah, so explain about that. I'll explain about the differences because we get to the scene where the stepsisters try on the slippers, so that's where the versions differ. Oh, definitely. Okay, and this is... Where a lot of people get uncomfortable about the German version. Because the French version actually pretty much follows... Fairy tale theater follows the French version pretty closely. The German version is pretty brutal. We have the first stepsister. She gets to take the shoe into another room with her mother. Which, first of all, I kind of wonder about that. And she can't quite get her foot in the shoe, so... Her mother says, just chop off your toe. Mm -hmm. I mean, you'll be carried around. You'll be carried around everywhere. She says that. You'll be carried around everywhere. You don't need your baby toe. Just chop off your toe. And she does. And she's bleeding as hell, but she got her foot in the shoe. And the prince, who is, as we've established already, not the brightest bulb in the pack, goes, oh, she got her foot in the shoe. I'll marry her. And takes her away. And doesn't get very far before the birds at Cinderella's mother's graves, the same one who provided the dress, go, Hey, dude, (laughs) look at the shoe. She's bleeding. It's clearly not the right girl. And the prince is going, Well, I missed it, but the birds told me that you're not cool. Oh, look at the blood. So he takes her back. And then he's really thick. And then he takes her back and the second stepsister goes into the next room. And now she can get her toes in, but her heel's sticking out. And her mom comes up with the wise idea, just chop off part of your heel, which she does. And she's bleeding, but she can still get her foot in the slipper. And Prince goes, hey, you got your foot in the slipper. You must be the girl. And again, the birds go, dude, she's bleeding. Not the right girl. Yet again. Prince can't figure out that this is not the woman you fell in love with. You know, this is very incendiary. There's a lot of blood on the shoe. There's a lot of blood on the shoe. Prince does not pick up on things. He literally needs birds to tell him because birds telling him is easier than looking at the shoe of the one that, you know, Prince is dumb. But he's a 
prints and he's rich. But anyway, so the birds tell him that he still got it wrong. Go back. So he goes back and this is when Cinderella steps forward and she's able to put her foot in the shoe and he takes her away and the birds go, you got it right this time, finally. And everyone, including me, breathes a sigh of relief. So in the German version, he marries Cinderella after he realizes she got her foot in the shoe without cutting something off. Thank God. Mutilation. We don't like it. Yeah. And at the wedding, the birds peck out the eyes of the stepsisters. Yeah. I didn't say it was pretty. (laughs) I said it was about karma. In the German version, it's very much about karma. Cinderella, who was sweet and did everything asked marries the handsome prince and the stepsisters who were evil had to go blind for the rest of their lives it's brutal but there's kind of a twisted ugly logic to it you get the sense of what the fairy tale was trying to say in the french version which is very very different the stepsisters try it on doesn't fit cinderella steps forward it fits She marries the prince, and she arranges for her stepsisters to marry lords the same day. because that's nice. Yeah, because she's that forgiving, and she wants... Because you kind of get the impression from the story, they were her only friends. She didn't know anybody else. She wanted them to be happy, so she'd at least have some friends to talk to. So the French version was more about forgiveness. The German version was more about karma. I kind of like how fairy tale theater played it a little bit in between. She tries on the slipper. She's recognized as the princess. And they're turned into rabbits, but just for 24 hours. Just until midnight. Just until midnight. So they get a little bit of the taste of their own medicine, but it's just temporary. I thought they kind of played it nicely in between. Because no one wants them to just be forgiven for being brats. They do kind of deserve a little bit of revenge, but... Yeah, not... When she realizes that, you know, this is with the fate that Cinderella is going to be, you know, married to the prince, she's like, well, you know, Cinderella, what are you going to say about your loving family? What are you going to say about us? The great you know, she Eve jumps, She jumps right to that. What does this mean for us? What do we get, basically? Yeah, I think that's probably why people find the French version very unsatisfying, because it's kind of human nature to say... You treated me like dirt. I don't particularly want to reward you for it. You kind of want to give them a little bit of a taste of their own medicine. So, Which it, I loved Ever After because she sends them off to be working as, you know, cleaning people that clean laundry. That's what she does for them. There are so many different give versions. Them, please, give, please award them the only the courtesy that they've awarded me. Dear listeners, Eric is baiting me to talk about the musical Ever After, which I refuse to We're take that bait. We're not talking about bait. that, travesty. <laughs> We're talking about the masterpiece of the movie with Drew Barrymore. <laughs> we unfortunately saw... Ever after the musical, it never made it to Broadway, and it never will. It never will. We can explain it. <laughs> we can explain in detail why it never will. To get back to what we were saying, there's so many different movie versions of Cinderella, and what happens to the stepmother and stepsisters really varies in yeah. every different version. And it really some, does. she just refuses to talk to them. That's what happened in Rodgers and Hammerstein's Cinderella. She just refuses to talk to them ever again. They're trailing behind her carriage and yeah. Rodgers and Hammerstein. You know what I love? She's Rogers locked out of the gates. I love Rodgers and Hammerstein's with Bernadette Peters. They're locked out she, of the gates. She tries to try on the slipper too, the stepmother. And they look at her like, are you kidding? By the great Bernadette Peters, yes, who was we, our sleeping beauty. We love Bernadette Peters in Rodgers and Hammerstein's Cinderella. We love Bernadette Peters full stop. Yeah, she's the best. But anyways, it's interesting to see how all the different live action versions, even the cartoon versions, have treated how the stepmother and stepsisters were treated after Cinderella married the prince. Because not many go as far as Brothers Grimm. Into the Woods went that far where they were blind. And then they were carrying around canes so <laughs> with, with glasses. glasses. It was hysterical. But that's the only one I know that followed that. The rest of them... In Disney, some, Disney didn't even tell you what happened Disney didn't tell you, although they made sequels. They made sequels, so we kind of knew. Most of the other versions, either Cinderella didn't talk to them, 
Slipper and the Rose, she forgave them. I'm trying to remember some of the other versions. They all just vary. Yeah, some of them, she turns them into servants like ever after. There's... Which I love that. I love that karma. Like, this is what you did to me. This is what I'm going to do to you. I'm going to make you into I'm a I'm trying servant. to remember. Like, even Ella Enchanted, I, I think she just let them live their lives. There's so many different versions out there. And I guess it kind of depends on how they framed the story with how they wanted their revenge. Yeah. But that's kind of a very interesting case study. Forgiveness or karma. It's interesting. I love that. And then, you know, I like this version. They just turn into rabbits until midnight. They just get a little bit of like, you know, let's shake them up a little bit. But I'm sure at the end, Cinderella is just going to... She'll let them go back to their... She'll let them do their best life. Whatever. I'm not sure she'd go as far as marrying inviting them off to Duke Or inviting them into the castle. Yeah, but... I doubt that. I doubt that too, because you want to forgive, but do you really want to forget? I guess that might be the ultimate thing. But it is all about kindness. Like we said, Cinderella is showing that kindness, despite what you're given in life, if you're kind and you overcome your bad situations, you'll prevail. You'll get your happy ending. That's a good thing to remember. It's ultimately not the stepsister's story. It's Cinderella's. And she was a good person, and she looked after people, and she had a good heart, and she was ultimately rewarded. So what happened to the stepsisters? You can change it up. Oh, we forgot to talk about right when she gets back from the ball. And she has a whole monologue where she's talking at the fairy godmother. Oh. She's going, this is unfair that you did this to me. Now, I wish I had never met you. All of that. We, we skipped over that whole entire part. We did, and anyone who's ever had a broken heart can relate to that moment. Because she's thinking to herself, like... This is it. Like, this is the last time I'm going to see him. There are no more balls. I wish there had never been any magic. Yeah. Because I'd never know what I was missing. Yeah, that was a really heartbreaking moment. It was sad. It was pretty powerful. That was a one-person monologue by Jennifer Beals. And yeah. I sometimes forget. I will give Jennifer Beals a lot of credit here. She's one of those actresses that is so beautiful that we sometimes forget how talented she actually is. Mm-hmm. And it sometimes gets lost. Like, Michelle Pfeiffer would be another one I could say that to. She's excellent. Yeah. They are both, just who's jumping to mind, they are both beautiful, beautiful actresses who are insanely talented, but we kind of forget how talented they are because we're so distracted by their beauty. So I give Jennifer Beals a lot of credit here. Mm -hmm. She did a gorgeous job. And she proved that she is a great actress because that was a beautiful monologue. That was like her second big role. Yeah. Like yeah. her big breakout role was Flash, Flash Dance. Dance. Flash Dance. What a feeling. Flash Dance was her very first big role. And this was like her second big role. Well. She even had really a leading role before these two. I'm not sure this was exactly a leading role, but she. It's a leading role. She's Cinderella. Well, okay. Just, I'm not sure it was that attention getting. I know she was okay. in The Bride. But you have to realize this is like midway through the series. And at this point, it was gaining traction in the series at this point. It wasn't in the early stages. Oh, I know Flashdance was certainly the reason she was cast. Oh, yeah, definitely. Because she was just gaining momentum from that. And I thought that was beautiful inspiration by Shelley to go, oh, beautiful girl in a dance movie. That's my Cinderella. And of course, we end in the second dress, the pretty dress. That's what she gets Put back into by the fairy godmother so that's always good gene stapleton appears again with that mm-hmm. put on southern accent that i mean yeah it's exaggerated but i like it it was well done it was cute we love it so eric our takeaways what were your favorite things and least favorite things about this episode favorite things i would say the casting i thought the casting was great for everything like even the minor characters oh agreed even down to mark blankfield as edgar wasn't he adorable (laughs) i love that i loved nancy lenahan oh yeah her little cameo and of course we loved david mccharen and we loved james nobel and arden i mean the stepsisters i mean everyone was great and don't forget our unseen hero joseph Mayer, narrating the whole thing he did such a great job yeah, setting back to aladdin yeah setting the, the <laughs> no i completely agree with you the casting was perfect and least favorite things that dress <laughs> <laughs> i will see your dress and i'll i'll Turn raise it. you the carriage turn it <laughs> god that 
Can we put it in the fireworks that oh, they used? Oh Can my we use God. it, put it in the fire ty- pyrotechnics? Now, and, and to be clear, <laughs> we're talking about dress night one. Dress Cause, night one. Because we both again. loved <laughs> dress night two. Dress that, night two was great. That yellow dress, I want to throw it away. It was ivory. It was I like, want It's trash. <laughs> I would throw it away. I hate it so much. I d- if that's my if I'm no, my least favorite thing, no pausing. It's that. It's that dress. See, I hate the dress with you. I'm right there with you, but the carriage with it's just oh, you hate the carriage. It's a lawn chair. It's not a lawn a, chair. It's like it's like your grandma's dining room chair. It's a lawn <laughs> chair on a tractor bed with twinkle lights. It's wild. It's wild. I agree. And you know what's the wildest thing about it, though? Is that in Puss in Boots, Princess Lavinia, she's like in a real carriage. You're right. Like a real carriage. Like a golden carriage. Like it's not a fake carriage. It's a real carriage with doors. They're like looking out the windows. You're right. You're absolutely right. They couldn't use that one? Because they re- recycled a lot of things. <laughs> oh, gosh. I don't understand. I have questions. <laughs> I don't understand. We'll call Shelly and ask. Shelly, why? <laughs> and if I know Shelly, she'll probably go, Raleigh, that's your question. <laughs> <laughs> what was your favorite thing? I really do love Eve Arden as the stepmother. I love her just eating it up. I guess I do love the casting because I can't think of one person that was miscast. No, it was perfect. That's it. I really have a hard time coming up with... Eve Arden is one of my favorites. She has some of the best lines. I mean, the Georgia girl in me would critique Gene Stapleton's accent a little bit. Oh, I loved it though. I know, but it was so... A vegetable. A vegetable. No one in Georgia talks like that. No, no one in Alabama talks like that. But I that, loved but, it. It was but like it just was, like a caricature. It was great. Exactly. I mean... Which is most of the things that when we see her again in fairy tale theater, that's a full-on caricature too. Like oh, yeah. When she's in Jack and the Beanstalk, which we'll discuss as well. I can't come up with one part that was miscast. And no. I... You know what? I'll say this. I love how all the bit parts were cast. I love James Noble. I love Tim Thomerson. I love David McCharron. I love Mark Blankfield showing up as Edgar. There were so many cute little... Another Jack and the Beanstalk throwback. Yeah, but I... <laughs> he knows I hate Jack and the Beanstalk. But <laughs> but I just love how all the little bit parts were able to shine. I mean... Yeah, everyone had a moment. Three lines, four lines. They were yeah. able to just shine. That might be my favorite part. How would you rate this episode on a scale of 1 to 10? I would say an 8.5 out of 10. Oh, that's high. Yeah. That's it's very probably, high. It's probably one of my favorite ones. It's the one I want is ones I look on very fondly. I don't know. It's just a feel good one. It's one of like the iconic ones I feel like from fairy tale theater like you think of. It is iconic. I'll agree with you on that. What stops me from rating it that high is that awkward as hell fountain scene. Well, I would have rated it higher if it wasn't for that scene. Yeah. It'd be like a nine. I'm not like five. a seven. Yeah, I'll call it a seven because Cinderella to me should be extremely romantic. And I really don't feel the romance between Jennifer Beals and Matthew Broderick. And that's no criticism on the actors. None. They were both totally committed. I think the direction mm. was there. It was the script and it was all the clunky dialogue. Yeah, it was awkward. And then they made her taller than him. It should have been a lot more romantic. And I'll contrast that with Dancing Princesses, which was pretty much shot on the same sets, let's be honest. Dancing Princesses, you had chemistry like crazy mm-hmm. with Peter Weller and Leslie Ann Warren. I just didn't get it from no. Jennifer Beals mm-hmm. and Matthew Broderick. And I'm not saying they were miscast. I think they were both beautifully cast. I think that was the script. I think that was a real weakness in the script. They tried to make them too young and it came across as awkward and uncomfortable. So that's my issue with it. Yeah, I agree. So... What's your takeaway from this? Is there anything you intend to learn more about? Anything you learned more about when we were doing this? Did the episode have any special message or meaning for you? Was there a theme? 
to the fairy tale. Well, I think we talked about the theme is that I know just Cinderella did. is a story about that kindness always prevails. I feel it's the general overarching theme in all of them. Absolutely. Whereas I feel that there's been some critique in recent years about Cinderella because they're saying like, oh, you know, she was just pushed around and you're basically teaching girls that, you know, we shouldn't really, I don't know if you've ever read about all the pushback about Cinderella that you shouldn't really teach little girls that their Prince Charming is out there waiting to rescue them. And it's like, that's not Did the you, theme in Cinderella. Did you, you didn't Cinderella. read Cinderella if you, if that was your no takeaway. One, no one rescued anyone. No, she didn't sit around waiting to be rescued. You know, it happened to befall upon her because she was so kind and so good and did so many good things. And even though she was dealt a shitty hand in life, she just had a positive outlook and continued to be kind to people. I completely agree with you. And when people say that about Cinderella, I'm going, did we read the same fairy tale? Because I don't remember Cinderella sitting at home and the prince just knocking on the door. That's not the fairy tale I remember. I remember Cinderella getting herself dressed and ready and going out and getting her prince. She's a go-getter. She is not waiting around for the prince to rescue her. She right. went out and got him. Because if she hadn't gone out and gotten his attention, he never would have come looking for her yeah exactly so i think people are forgetting that part of the story yeah and i think that's like what makes cinderella always so special for me is always my favorite fairy tale so yeah really this is your favorite fairy tale well, yeah you never told me that yeah ladies and gentlemen <laughs> <laughs> i never knew this yes it was always my favorite well as far as like fairy tales go it's not my, it's not my favorite fairy tale theater episode no then no but Definitely my favorite um, Disney movie growing up. I broke that VHS several times. So did I. <laughs> I broke mine too. I like ripped. For those of you that are not aware of the struggles of VHS, if you watch the VHS tape too many times, the, the tape would get worn out and break and rip. I didn't have a break. And then it would get lost inside of the cassette. No, I didn't have a break, but I had to go and turn all fuzzy no, and it, everything. it broke. It legit broke. Oh. Mine didn't break, but it got so warped that we couldn't watch yeah, it after. We watched it so many times. It just got worn down. Yep. The struggle. Yeah. Oh. Before the days of streaming, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> now you can just stream. There's no breaking things anymore. We are the generation of VHS. <laughs> yes. But there was something special about that. And about looking for these episodes that we couldn't find. Although Cinderella was always one we could find. This one was always one that was readily yeah. available, yeah, I Yeah, I was think. able to find that one. That was an easy one. Not like Princess and the Pea. That some of us spent years and years and even wrote to Shelley Duvall to try and find. And it was worth it. I found Shelley Duvall before I found that VHS. <laughs> Different story. All right. So I think... We shouldn't go anywhere without reading Emily's oh, review no. from her. Oh, no. I was hoping you'd forget this part. We always do this. It's tradition. Tradition. <laughs> That's a kind way of saying he tortures me <laughs> with every episode he finds this. So to those of you who don't know what's going on, back in the day, I put up a fairy tale theater website. I, I guess it was the first or at least one of the first. Yeah, one of the first. Websites dedicated to fairy tale theater. I put this up, I want to say 1996 or 1997. Something like that. I was a teenager and I wrote reviews for every single episode back in the day. And I have not reread these reviews, but Eric has found them and he likes to read them to me. On every podcast. So that's... It's become a tradition. I am not in favor of this tradition, but Eric is a big fan of this part, so... The quote you chose was obviously from the fairy godmother. You always put a starting quote that I guess like is the standout Oh, quote. wait, no, I remember what I put. The it's, cake was you already did it all made. Your, you did it all yourself. The cake was already made. All, all I, I did, did was, was add, add the, the frosting. frosting. I love that. I love that. I think that's a great quote for the fairy godmother. The cake was already made. All I did was add the frosting. That's exactly what the fairy godmother did. So you gave this three stars. Okay. But mm -hmm. I guess I gave it a, a seven out of ten. I guess I'm still kind of there. You wrote, Cinderella is probably the best known and best beloved fairy tales around. The oldest story in time and the most commonly adapted story in history. Every girl in the world has hope for her own Cinderella ending. This production is simply charming. Oh. 
Jennifer Beals is the sweetest Cinderella ever. She is. She's very doe-eyed. I'll give you that. Beals' portrayal is sweet and genuine. She does not allow her character to appear dumb, as is often the result. Do you agree with that still? I think so. She doesn't appear dumb. I don't think Cinderella ever but comes across think, dumb. Yeah, that's what I'm struggling with. I'm like, I don't remember Cinderella. Snow White comes across as dumb. Cinderella? Not so much. Yeah, no. Put upon, yes. Dumb? No. In Matthew Broderick, they found the perfect Prince Charming. He's cute. He's suave. He's adorable. He's charming. Well, I think any girl would gladly run away from the cinders to dance with him at a ball. Well. I wouldn't. Yeah, um, uh, this production also benefits from having great comic supports. Jean Stapleton's Southern Lady Fairy Godmother and Eve Arden's Crabby Stepmother are the real scene, scene stealers, stealers here. Edie McClurg also has a great time as one of the stepsisters. Costuming is great. Sets are top notch. Uh, Okay, I'll change my mind on that one. And the music perfectly sets the tone to this winning piece. And this production is a treat from beginning to end. Well, I stand behind most of that. I don't like that I didn't pay tribute to... All the supporting characters? No, Jane Alden is the other stepsister. She deserved... Jane Alden was good. Yeah, she deserved as much kudos as Edie McClurk. The music? Mother, I hate that door thing. What do you mean intelligent? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, she deserved as many kudos as Edie McClurk. I was probably just more familiar with Edie McClurk at the time. The costuming in the sets I gave? Yeah, the... mm. Costuming is great. Sets are top notch. Uh Uh-huh. Did I see the same (laughs) coach that you saw? I guess you were kind back Uh, then. I think I was probably still swept in the magic. I also keep in mind, this was over 20 years ago, that ivory dress wasn't as dated then as it is now. But I still say she was sitting on a lawn chair on a parade float. Yeah, that was rough. Actually, as far as my dated reviews go, I'm standing behind most of that. Yeah, that's pretty good. Except yeah. about wanting to run away to the ball with Matthew Broderick. Well... He was all right. And compared to other princes, we're going to get to hot princes, ladies and gentlemen. They're smoking princes out oh, there. Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. <laughs> I'm not naming names, but Treat Williams, you know I'm, I'm thinking of you. Jeff Bridges. Treat Williams. Chuck Bridges. Trey Williams. <laughs> Rex Smith wasn't too shabby, though, either. No, Rex Smith was great. That was good. Chris Reeve. Yeah, that was real good, too. And Shelly loved to put them all in tights. So we love that. And she talked him into it. <laughs> so this has been our review of Cinderella. Thank you for joining us for Welcome to Tonight's Tale and our review of Cinderella again. My name is Emily. And my name is Eric. And they all live happily ever after. And join us for tonight's tale when we review The Dancing Princesses. Thank you. Thank you and good night.